welcome you here. My name is Madison Brownlee, and I am honored to welcome you on behalf of Yakima Chief Hobbs to this virtual harvest session. Today we're going to be discussing Talus, which you may or may not be familiar with that name yet, formerly HBC 692, and some of the process and histories surrounding the history of experimental hops. So I will now turn it over to Jim Lambert, which may be a familiar face for many of you, to introduce our speaker today. Well, for the most of you, good morning to you and uh, good evening for you here in the States. Um, really excited for the program today, uh, as Madison just mentioned, uh, a history of, uh, of our experimental program and then with specific with the 692 or TALUS recently released. And our guest here today is uh, Joe Catron. Joe is the Vice President at Yakima Chief Ranches, which is our breeding and crop management partner here in Yakima. Um, Joe has a very interesting background. Uh, he has a degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Cultural Anthropology from Western Washington University. And, and like a lot of all hop people, he went and got his master's in agriculture over at Washington State, kind of hedged the bets there. But putting that aside, probably the most interesting thing about his career is that Joe, before he got into this business, was a rocker with uh, Cody Beebe and the Crooks touring the Pacific Northwest playing a lot of music. And uh, for those of you who ever get back to the States have a chance to possibly see him play, I highly recommend it. Um, one of the more interesting people, very knowledgeable, and we're very grateful that he would take his evening. He's been on a 16-hour day. So, Joe, thank you so much for joining us, um, and please. Awesome, Jim. Thanks for the awesome introduction. Um, let me go ahead and Get my screen shared here. Are we in pre presentation there mode there? Does that look right to you guys or is it not in the... Okay. Can you all see that slide there? Sorry, I'm having trouble here getting the right screen. Apologize for this. I can pull it up too if you need me to. Can you do that, Nicole? I'm having trouble sharing here. I think it's working now. Is it working now? Awesome. Hey, sorry about that. Like Jim said, I, I, uh, I've been working since four o'clock this morning, so I'm a, I'm a little dazed and confused, as they say. Um, but long, crazy, long, crazy days during hop harvest. But uh, incredibly happy to be here with you all and look forward to, to chatting more about uh, the kind of history and future of Yagam Chief Ranches and our experimental hop program and how that affects you as brewers um, and how we can work together as, as partners to uh, get these hops out of the market more effectively and, and get more brewers using them. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump right in here. Hey Joe, we see your slideshow, but not in presentation mode. We see yeah. it in the PowerPoint. Is, let me try this one. Better now? No? Same time. I'm sorry. You want me to do it, Joe? I'm hitting the slideshow button. Here, Joe, I can do it. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Sorry about that. No worries. So can I control the slides now, Nicole, or do you have to? I will. Okay. So uh, yeah, we can go ahead and, and switch to the next slide there and we'll go over just a brief kind of intro of what we'll be talking about today. So uh, early on, we'll just go over the importance of hot breeding programs, why, why hot breeding programs exist, um, the importance and some of the outcomes of those programs throughout history, um, why our particular breeding program at Yakima Chief Ranches began and, and now some of our goals going in the future. 
uh, we'll go through the hot breeding development cycle um, and all the different stages of selection uh, that we go through to develop new varieties and then bring those to market. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we'll talk about once we do uh, bring new commercial brands to market, we'll talk about our footprints brand management program and how uh, the Aqua Chief supply chain really goes above and beyond any of our competitors and protecting the quality and the consistency of our brands um, with, with uh, our brewing customers in mind, knowing that they are, are paying a lot of their hard earned money for these hops and, and we, we work as hard as we can to ensure that we're delivering the hops that they deserve. Uh, we'll go into a few of our uh, commercial releases over the years. And then we'll talk a little bit about how Yakima Chief hops and Yakima Chief ranches are, are aligned vertically um, to protect the value in our, in our supply chain. We're going into a, a little bit, uh, kind of a heat map, um, um, discussing the variability and all the, the different, uh, the vast genetic expressions of hops and how a lot of those are showing in our, in our uh, recent elite lines. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk with Doug Pierce and he'll talk a little bit about uh, how Talus has been performing uh, with his, in his brewery. Um, so I'm excited to hear from him because I, I know I really love brewing with it. Um, and I'm not even close to a professional brewer, so um, love to see what type of expression he's getting out of that hop. And uh, we'll end with a little Q&A session. Uh, to just start off, uh, be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the mission, vision, values of Yakima Chief Hops. Um, really key in on the fact that uh, our mission is to connect family hop farms to the world's finest brewers. Uh, we at Yakima Chief Hops and Yakima Chief Ranches um, are a grower-owned entity, completely 100% grower-owned entity. It makes us unique. In our, in, in our industry. None of our competitors um, are owned by the hop farmers that are growing the crop. And so we, we know that that really adds uh, a lot of value, gives us a lot of flexibility, and we uh, really value those relationships we've built over the years with, with our brewing partners and look forward to uh, continued sustainability for, for both of our family farms and both of our family brewers. Uh, so there's a picture of a few of our growers there. We've actually, over the last uh, six months, um, added a few more. Uh, so we've got three more growers now um, across Washington and Idaho. Excuse me, Washington, Oregon. Uh, maybe some Idaho growers soon. Hopefully that would be nice to bring some Idaho guys in the mix. Um, but uh, yeah, again, just, just the, the fact that we're 100% grower-owned hop company uh, makes us very unique and agile in the industry. And uh, we, we truly believe that that makes us uh, superior to our competition in a lot of ways. Yakima Chief Ranches, a little background on us. So uh, three of those farmers that you just saw on the previous slide um, got together back in the, back in the 1980s um, with the express intent of, of creating value in the hop industry. As, as we'll see in, in some slides coming up here, uh, at the time, the American hop industry was, was predominantly alpha. Um, it was predicated on those older alpha varieties um, uh, based on efficiencies, uh, creating big crops with big alpha um, loads and, and, and just really uh, leading, the, leading the world industry in creating that commodity, that alpha acid. Um, the fact that it is a commodity lends itself to boom bust cycles, just like any other commodity in the world. Um, and that was no different with hops. Um, at that time, a lot of the growers in, in the US were, were struggling just to stay afloat. Um, if you can picture back then we didn't have um, awesome breweries in Beijing and, and Taipei and, and even anywhere in the, in the U.S. We didn't have um, incredible brewers, uh, you know, in every major city. Uh, there, were, there were very few uh, customers and there were only a couple really large multinational conglomerates that uh, managed and, and controlled the, the trade um, of the world's hop crop. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of growers um, were under the thumb of those large powerful companies and a lot of farms uh, went out of business or were um, acquired by other larger farms. And um, there was really some dark days uh, in the hop industry that, that followed those, those boom bust trends of, of, the, com of the commodity market. Um, so it's with that in mind that, that, these three, that these three family farms, the Peralt family, the Carpenter family, and the Smith family up at BT Loftus, got together um, to, to truly uh, invigorate value and, and create value in the hop industry. Um, so just key in on that is, is our mission vision values um, for Yakima Chief Ranches is really to create, grow, and protect value. And so you'll see um, 
how we how we do that with various phases of our supply chain. Um, and uh, we, we, we know that, that that value that we that we are creating in the industry is playing out all across the world. Um, people are being able to reinvest in their facilities. People are um, expanding their brew house and expanding their farms uh, to, to meet the needs of, of our collective customers. And it's really exciting to see uh, that value creation come from within our breeding program and be, and be spread up across to everyone within our footprint. Um, also a keynote there, uh, Jason Peralt, who is uh, the CEO of Yakum Chief Ranches, um, very knowledgeable, incredibly uh, passionate hot breeder. Um, he, he was still in college back, back in the day, and, and he got to study under the renowned hot breeder Chuck Zimmerman, who is uh, responsible for many of the old sea hops, uh, Cascade, Columbus, Chinook, a lot of those sea hops that came out of the USDA breeding program uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Th those were Chuck Zimmerman's crosses as well. So um, the, 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 the three family farms were able to, to convince Chuck to come out of retirement and, and moonlight as the first breeder of Yakima Chief Ranches. Um, and so our, our heritage of, of breeders really goes back all the way to the beginning with Chuck and, and now into the future with, with Jason Peralt and that uh, direct link um, study under him is a really cool story. So getting into a little bit how we fit uh, as, as sister companies, as I like to say, um, I know it can be a little bit confusing uh, with all the acronym soup for a lot of uh, the different entities, but but really, uh, this is a good way to look at uh, our supply chain uh, on the Yakima Chief family. So uh, Yakima Chief ranches, and then you'll see that there are our footprints uh, quality protection program. We're really forming that, that one corner piece down there on the farm and, and the research and development side. Um, we really rely on, on the rest of our partners at Yakima Chief Hops uh, to, to, carry, to carry it all on from there. So um, that value creation coming from within uh, the breeding program is, is then passed on and entrusted to, to YCH to, to take those hops, process them into the, into the various hop products that they, that they produce, and then effectively get those hops out to their brewing customers around the world. Uh, one really important uh, part of, of closing this link, obviously, is that upper right corner, the forecast and feedback from our brewing partners. Um, back in the day when there was uh, just a handful of brewing customers and just a couple large hop merchants, um, it was a very common practice for those middlemen, those merchants to try to keep growers and, and brewers as far apart as possible. Um, it, it's easy to, to, to think about why uh, with, with, their, with their business models. Uh, it's very much a, a buy sell model. So they're trying to procure hops uh, at cheapest price they possibly can, turn them into uh, pellets or extract and then sell them to uh, their brewing customers for the best profit. Um, just like any other capitalist uh, company, that's how uh, our competitors still still work to this day. Um, at Yakima Chief Hops, we truly believe that bringing brewers and growers together is not only something that we should shy away from, it is absolutely something we should be intentional about um, and, and, and keep getting to know our brewing customers better, uh, allow them to be able to trust us um, with their needs and be able to, to communicate uh, what's working and what's not in their brew house um, and communicate their, their future needs. Um, and so I really encourage you as, as customers of the Yakima Chief supply chain, uh, stay really involved, stay close with, with, your, with your sales manager, stay close uh, with those of us in, in the farming industry. Uh, we, we always love to have brewers out and show them around and, and teach them more about what we're doing and, and just get to know them as people and really close this loop here. Um, it's incredibly important for us to, to bring those two entities together as our mission statement uh, suggests. And uh, we, it's easy to, to know whether or not uh, any of our operations are, are meeting our mission, because if it's not bringing family hop farms and the world's finest brewers together, it's not meeting our mission. So we'll go ahead and jump into hop breeding and the, and the future of Varoma. Uh, the, the why, the how, and, and what we're doing, uh, how, where it's come from and where it's going. So this is, a, this is a pretty amazing graph. Um, every time I see this, I, I, I just can't believe that it's, that it's real, but it actually has. So I haven't been around quite this long. Uh, this is my eighth harvest this year. Um, but look on that first bar, the blue bar there on the left, that's 2011. You can look at that and see that the alpha production right there on the left is uh, about 17,000 acres roughly, judging by that. 
And then you look at the blue bar in, in the middle set of bars there, that's the aroma acreage in the United States. Uh, far below 10,000 acres, uh, nearly doubled um, by the alpha acreage uh, in the United States. And just look at the trend since then. Every year we're setting record uh, acre, uh, records with uh, the amount of acres and the amount of production um, in the United States. Uh, 2020, uh, unsurprisingly, may, may, we may not uh, set a new record for various reasons. Um, had a lot of windstorms. We've had the COVID-19 pandemic that has uh, really dampened a lot of, of sales and, and changed the way we're, we're, we're uh, growing hops at this point. We don't want to uh, flood the market with a bunch of hops that can't be used. Um, so not to get too far down the dark rabbit hole of 2020, things are uh, looking up, obviously, um, for, for hop growers and, and for brewers alike. And hopefully we'll get past this and continue down the, the path of uh, uh, continued growth and sustainability in our industry. But just amazing to look at those bars now and look at 2019, we have well over nearly 40,000 acres of aroma hops uh, in the United States. And Alpha still is dancing right in between that kind of 10 and 15,000 acres. Uh, so you can see that dramatic swing uh, of the, per, uh, the portion, the, the majority of the acres in, in the Yakima, Oregon, and the Idaho growing regions shifting to aroma varieties. So looking at uh, the trends of alpha hop efficiency and just the overall uh, yields of hops. Um, we talked about alpha hops earlier being uh, just based on efficiencies, really just big yields, big alpha acid numbers, uh, not really concerned about aroma or appearance or the handling or anything of those hops. It's really about get, get the alpha acid, extract it uh, into cans and, and get it out for, for bittering purposes around the world. Um, and so a lot of alpha, super alpha varieties are, are huge yielders, um, as you imagine, it's just based on efficiency. So uh, with the exception of Mosaic and Palisade, the top 10 uh, yielding hop brands are super alpha varieties. Um, and so as our acres increase or a proportion of acres increase toward aroma, um, our overall yields tend, are tending, uh, trending down rather um, over the years because aroma varieties are, are lower yielders than alpha varieties. And if you look at average yields here, just this kind of uh, doubles down on what I just said, but all, all five of those lowest uh, yielders right there are aroma varieties, right? Um, nobles, and, and then you'll see the Centennial in there, which um, Centennial is a great hop. It makes great beer, um, but it's an incredibly low yielding hop. Um, it was bred back in the 80s, and it is susceptible to just about anything uh, we see uh, in commercial hop production as far as scourges, whether it be mildews or mites. Um, Centennial is susceptible to just about anything. Um, so while the, the flavor and aroma that it provides in beer uh, can, can be exceptional, uh, on the growing side, it, it doesn't really check as, uh, as many boxes as we would like for uh, one of our varieties if we were to release that today. So why is this important? We talk about that value creation. Like I said, the, the, going back to the mission of, of our company is to create, grow, and protect value. Um, you can go ahead and hit that next button. Nicole just drops down, it'll drop down there. But um, really looking at that value creation is right there in that breeding program. So coming up with a new novel variety um, that has nice disease resistance, um, acceptable, nice yields, um, uh, fits fits our harvest windows. That's, that's something that, uh, not a lot of people think about, but harvest window is an incredibly important criteria in us selecting uh, new varieties of, of hop to bring to market. Uh, and then obviously storability, um, cost of acre of production, all those things matter on the end to create and protect value that is ultimately being translated to that to those brewing customers on the end and, and into, into your customers' glasses. Um, we love to see brewers use our brands on their packaging um, to promote their beers. And this beer is made with Simcoe. And the fact that their customers see that brand and associate that with value, associate that with an excellent hop, that's ultimately what we're going for. And that's where that value creation is. It starts in the breeding program and extends all the way to the pints that our, that our customers are enjoying. So jumping in the development cycle here for, for bringing a hop to market, uh, you'll see there over 11 years to breed. That is a uh, 
that is accurate. That's, that's, that's actually about a decade long process um, from cross to commercialization. Um, any, any given year we have uh, typically between about 30 and, and 50,000 uh, genetically unique seedlings. Um, so a really cool thing about hops, and it's, they're not the only field plant in the world like this, but uh, there's not a whole lot, but uh, the term is dioecious. So plants, um, we have male and female uh, individuals within, within the hop genome. So we're able to uh, effectively collect male pollen and introduce that, that pollen uh, in, onto a re receptive female flower. Um, she will still go on to create hop cones, but they'll be heavily seeded. And each of those seeds will take and thresh out. And that is basically the, the year one there. So that parental selection and crossing that you see in year one is the actual cross. So just collecting pollen, uh, introducing that into a receptive female flower and making that cross and then collecting those seeds from that cross. Uh, year two in the program, is when we'll go ahead and screen those. So we'll germinate those seedlings in the greenhouse and screen them for those mildews and those different disease susceptibilities that we spoke about earlier um, that will basically eliminate a hop from our selection process. If we um, see that hops are incredibly susceptible to whether powdery or downy mildew or both or um, rhizoctonia or any, any various uh, diseases that it, that it could be affected by, we eliminate those plants uh, right, right in year two, right in the, in the greenhouse screening. Um, if they make it through greenhouse screening, then we're, they plant it out into our seedling plot. So every year we have, that's where those 30 to 50,000 seedlings are planted every single year. Um, we'll really baby those along to try to just get them up to the point where they will, they themselves will sexually express. Um, we'll be able to identify males from females. Um, obviously for, for our for our needs, we're just looking for, for female hops. Those are the only ones with real commercial value uh, as of right now. Um, and so we will evaluate those female plants. And if it makes it through that first round of selection in the seedling plot, uh, we're able to dig up that root mass. So uh, just growing for one season, uh, it's roughly kind of about the size of your fist. Um, so we can dig up that plant, that plant mass, uh, mark it with its number, and, and move that over to what we call single hill, number three right there, years three, four, and five. Uh, single hill uh, identifies just the one single plant, uh, each genetically unique, that's planted next to each other in single hill and raised to a full commercial trellis, evaluated for three full seasons there for in, in a whole battery of criteria, um, and evaluated for both agronomic and, and brewing uh, commercial uh, capabilities. Um, at that point, if it makes it through uh, the selections in single hill, we're able to, at that point, take enough rhizomal uh, cuttings or, or tissue culture, uh, soft tissue cuttings, and, and take that one variety and blow that up into about seven plants. So on the, on the next slide there, you'll see uh, number four. So years six, seven, and eight are what we call our advanced selections. So we're taking that one single hill plant, taking planting a uh, rhizomes basically off that off that crown off that root mass and planting them out and raising seven identical plants right next to each other for another three full years of evaluation. Um, the reason for that is it's a nice intermediary there between one plant where you may or may not get the full story of, of what that plant is capable of with just one plant even within three years of evaluation with all the variability in weather um, and, and other different conditions that we deal with in, in commercial production. Um, it's really hard to get a, a perfectly clear picture just with one individual. Um, so blowing that up into seven plants gives us a little bit better idea, uh, especially on the agronomic side, how, how that may fare if we're able to take that to the next, to the next layer. Um, so you'll see there in, um, in uh, number five there, thank you, Nicole, uh, years nine through 11 are the elite trials. So this is where it gets to the point where it gets that HBC accession number. It starts getting in the hands of guys like Jim and Percy and getting out into the market. Uh, we've got it blown up to maybe an acre, an acre planting or two or three acre plantings um, in, in separate growing regions to see how it, it fares in, in different climates. Um, and then we really start getting it into the hands of our brewing customers at that point and seeing how it performs in the brew house. Um, at that point, we, it's checked enough boxes for us that we have short-term buy-in with our, with our growers that, hey, this is something that uh, seems viable. I'm willing, I'm willing to put in the yard of that. Um, but really we're looking for that long-term buy-in by our brewing customers, um, incorporating that, that new brand into, into their beer, into their beer, multiple beers, um, 
and ultimately uh, having a long-term relationship with that hop that's something that uh, will be in their in their brew house for years to come um, and then at, only at that point once we have a really strong grower buy-in or brewer buy-in rather is when we would consider commercializing that brand so uh, Jason my boss likes to say we, we want brands to be pulled into the market um, you know there's 200 plus uh, different varieties of hops available at your disposal as we speak. Um, we don't, we're not in any hurry to push uh, more, more brands onto the market. We, we really want to um, have those, those brands be pulled onto the market by those brewing customers, um, having that value play out in their particular brew house and uh, make, make the difference in what they're doing and ultimately lead, uh, lead the way for us to continue to develop those brands. As, uh, as demand grows. So you can see here, there's a little demarcation there. So prior to uh, 2007, we were um, operating just independently as Yakima Chief Ranches and had several commercial su successes there, most notably Simcoe, um, which hopefully you all know and love. Um, and then after, after that, we, we joined a partnership uh, with HBC. So we're one half of the hot breeding company. And you can see there since since 2007, we've had several uh, commercial successes, Citra Mosaic, Equinot, uh, Sabro, and Pato in 2018. And then you see there on the end, Talus, which we just released uh, just a couple weeks ago. And we're incredibly excited for the future of that brand. So at that point, once we, once we have uh, agronomic buy-in, we have growers that are willing to grow uh, these new these new brands we have brewers that are that are excited to use them in, in their beer um, we take that and we go ahead and commercialize those brands at that point that's where the Yakima Chief supply chain really separates ourselves from our competition uh, both on on quality consistency and really just investing in our facilities investing in food safety um, investing in long-term uh, sustainability for for the for the growing and brewing industries and so that's where our footprints program comes in uh, that is something that I've been uh, very fortunate to be a part of since the, its inception. I was actually one of uh, the first interns for this program when I first started here at the farm and have grown into managing this program over the years. And um, just uh, really one of my favorite parts of my job, getting to work with uh, a lot of young people that come in and, and learn about industry and contribute to all of our, our quality initiatives uh, through the summer. And uh, also just help with uh, our outreach into the community and and all sorts of great things that we like to hang our hat on and, and be part of our collective communities uh, where, where we live and, far, and work. So you can see there, uh, like I said, in 2013, this Footprints program started. Uh, we were working with just eight growers and just shade over 2,000 acres, um, which at the time seemed, seemed like a lot. It was just me and two interns. Uh, that seemed like a lot of acres covered for the, just the two of us. Uh, but as things progressed, you can see there uh, in last year, we worked with uh, over 40 growers and over 15,000 acres. And so uh, that growth that that growth you saw on the on the graph earlier, uh, it's not all of us, but that's a lot of that growth is definitely uh, within our, our group of growers and, and within our brands. So it's uh, pretty awesome to see and uh, very proud to just be a part of this growth and, and continued success for, for all of our growers and brewing customers. So we talked about this a little bit already, the decade of development and really uh, keen in, I, on, I guess on that grower acceptance short term, but really they're, they're on bold on the bottom, that brewer acceptance long term. Um, so we can go ahead and get to the next slide and we'll get into a little bit about understanding aroma, just the complexity of, of aroma in, in hops. You know, the, I'm not sure the exact number, but the hop genome is, is uh, just a shade under the human genome. It's, it's pretty uh, incredible how complex it is um, and, and just how uh, little we know about it, really. Um, so there's there's a whole lot of whole lot of frontier, whole lot of runway there um, for us to collectively learn about the different compounds and hops and how they survive in beer and how they influence fl flavor and aroma. Um, so I just want to put this chart up there. You can see from from left to right there across the top is 438, so Sabro, and then on the far right is 692, so Talus. Those four in between there, 472, 520, 630, and 638, uh, those are our elite lines. So if you think about a couple slides ago, these are these are the ones in years nine through 11 there. Where they've got the accession number, uh, we've got multiple acres, uh, larger plantings planted out and are uh, have quantities available for our brewing customers to, to use. 
and uh, get to know. So I just wanted to show you just the, the, the different uh, kind of hot, the heat map here and how, uh, how much variation there can be just within, within hops. So uh, I want to key in uh, on 438 and 472. So Sabro and 472 right next to it there. Uh, those are maternal sisters. Um, came from the exact same cross, uh, were, were seeds in, in uh, the exact same cross and, and were planted out right next to each other. And you just see their, uh, you know, total oils, for example, in Sabra, over 3% oil, uh, just a gigantic oil hop. Uh, 472 is only half that. Uh, you look at myrcene, 62% of the, of, the, of the compound in, in 438 in Sabro is, is, is myrcene. Uh, only about half that, 36 in, in 472. You drop down and look where the, look where 472 has those hot spots. Caryophylline, 28 caryophylline is off the chart. You see 522 there right next to it at 22, but everything else we've ever seen uh, is is far below 20. So those two are, are really exceptional with that caryophylline. And what, and what we're finding is that caryophylline is what is contributing to a lot of that woody flavor, a lot of those white notes, the oakiness, the the coconut, uh, the cedar, those type of flavors. Uh, so just kind of awesome to see. Uh, as we continue to learn about these different compounds and how they contribute uh, to see how we can, how we can take uh, the future of aroma and, and use some of these telltale signs to either uh, contribute into new crosses um, or use down the line in other breeding uh, operations. Again, this is, this is Sabro here. So the next, the next couple slides um, are just uh, those, those same that we just saw there, but what, broken down individually like this. Um, most notably, I guess, you know, this is uh, kind of centered on talus. So if, if we want to uh, skip through a little bit there towards the end, the last one would be 692. I'd encourage you 630 and 638 are both really awesome hops too, especially 638. I've been really loving that one lately. Um, so if there's any questions on that one specifically, uh, please reach out or ask at the end of the, of the uh, event here, and I'd be happy to talk about those more. But uh, for now, let's, let's focus on talus. So you look at that. Uh, talus is a daughter of Sabro. Uh, remember that the super high oil levels of Sabro up above three. So 692 is not quite there, but still uh, you know, 2.78 on oil, uh, total oils is a huge oil hop. That's something that we, that we see a pretty strong correlation between uh, oil and in, impact in hops. So the more oil there is, the more chance there are survival, survivable compounds to make it through the, the brewing process and ultimately into that glass of beer. Um, so we can, we can get into uh, you know, a lot of the different components of talus, but ultimately, um, anecdotally, you know, I just am always impressed by um, how, what you smell in the field, what you smell in, in the raw hop sample, uh, how that translates right into the finished beer. Um, there, are, there are numerous examples of, of hops that uh, you know, smell, smell excellent in the field and you can't wait to go brew with them. And then for whatever reason, they, they just don't perform. It just doesn't translate. Um, Conversely, there, there are times when you'll smell something in the field that smells like diesel and Parmesan cheese and you brew with it and it just is exceptional. Um, so there's, like I said, there's a lot that we don't know um, and that, that we still need to learn. Um, Talus is not one of those hops. Uh, like I said, what, what, you, what you experience in, in the field, what you experience in that, in that bag of pellets is really what you're gonna be getting uh, on the nose of that beer. And so that's what really excites us about this variety. Um, you can see the, the, heat, the heat map on the linalool, humulene, and geraniol um, really leading, leading that, that citrus, that impact, that floral impact. So it's really led by, by big, uh, I guess personally, uh, big pink grapefruit, big juicy ripe pink grapefruit up front, um, closely seconded by, by, a, by a nice uh, stone fruit. You know, they say peach up there. I, I get kind of more of, a, more of a sour twang, almost like a nectarine almost. Um, and then the herbal note that, that I think is that comes through for me uh, every single time and makes this uh, really unique and, and more nuanced and, and a, a complex just by itself is it's got the big fruit, but also a really nice almost sage, uh, sage herbal note that uh, just dances really nicely with, with, the, with the pink grapefruit. Um, and so, like I said, this is, this is something that uh, we just released just a couple weeks ago. Um, but I know that a lot of brewing customers have been excited about uh, about this hop for a long time, working with it as 692, and uh, I just can't wait to see uh, where we can take this brand. So at that point, uh, I mean, I guess at, at this point, we can go ahead and, and transition um, over, to, over to Doug's presentation. 
Um, oh, we got one more. We got one more chart there. And I guess is that kind of the ultimate payoff there is uh, why, why our breeding program is important. Um, so you look there on the top 10 uh, hop varieties by acres again. Um, so half of those, half those varieties are uh, proprietary and 40% of those brands. So Pato, Mosaic, Simcoe, and, and Citra uh, all came out of our breeding program. So uh, that is a pretty good representation of how impactful uh, these new hot brands have been in our industry um, and how we continue to, to lead our industry into the future. And so uh, again, uh, happy, to, happy to chat and have, have a little Q&A session later. Uh, really appreciate your time and uh, uh, look forward to getting to know as many uh, of you as I can. Cheers. Oh, are you making a video? And now we're going to hand it over to our VP of Asia Sales, Percy Lamb, to introduce our next guest. Over to you, Percy. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Today, you know, I'm very excited, you know, to introduce you, you know, Dove. Yeah. Dove, you know, is the founder, you know, of Redpoint Brewery. Uh, he, he has stayed, you know, in Asia, you know, for many years. Yeah. He has a degree, you know, in electrical uh, engineering and a master, you know, in business. Uh, six years ago, yeah, he and his partner, Spencer, have established, you know, the Redpoint Brewery, uh, which is now, you know, one of the uh, premium you know, brewery in Asia. As well as you know, a brewery you know, that can help you know other you know full contract brewing. Rapon Brewery is also you know the first front on the brewery in Taiwan, producing you know the first domestically brewed IPA. Uh, the Chinese name I remember is called Thai IPA. So uh, recently, you know, Dove you know have made a collaboration beer you know of IPA with two local brewery. The first one is. Samai Brewery, and then the other one is Taihu Brewery, yeah, using Talus. So today, yeah, he will share with you how he see, you know, this is not Talus Hub. Dub, uh, I'd like to pass it to you. Yep, sure thing. Thanks, Percy. Um, I'll try to share a screen, <laughs> see if it works properly. That working? Everybody see that? Yes, yes. You can see it. Fantastic. Um, okay. So as Percy said, I'm one of the co-founders of Red Point Brewing Company, and we're based here in uh, in Tai uh, in Taiwan, uh, just outside of Taipei. And uh, Percy sent over uh, some of this hop uh, variety for us to brew a little bit of a of a collaboration beer with and introduce it uh, actually this weekend on Saturday to uh, at one of the bars here locally in, in, tai, in Taipei. Um, so what we did was we, we, brewed, an, we brewed an IPA and, and dry hopped it with basically everything they gave us. And uh, it turned out amazingly well. I had my first chance to pull a little carafe of it off of the uh, fermenter yesterday uh, evening uh, as I was coming back into town. Uh, I stopped at, because uh, we brewed it at Sun Mai Brewing Company. Uh, so uh, they have a smaller system uh, and we brewed about uh, 300 liters of it. So it's a very, very tiny brew compared to, you know, what most of us are used to brewing at, you know, around 30 or 40, 30 to 60 barrels. So, um, but we got a, we, we, we managed to get it done and uh, I pulled some of it off yesterday and, and had a nice uh, long kind of tasting session with it. Um, and so this is what we came up with. Let me see if I can shut that down. 
So the, uh, the beer is basically, we use just a, a standard kind of IB, IPA based beer uh, for, the, uh, for the beer. It's a 6% alcohol. Um, we set it at about 40 IBU and 20 EBC and used a real clean fermenting uh, USO5 ale yeast so we could make sure that all that the hop was the, uh, was the predominant uh, flavors coming through. Uh, we used uh, Pato for the, for the bittering, uh, a little bit of Equinot as a late stage addition, and then we dry hopped, uh, dry hopped it significantly, uh, well, with what we had actually. We probably could have used a bit more, but uh, it, was, uh, it was good. Um, at about one pound per barrel for the U.S. people and 400 grams per hectoliter for everybody else. Um, and we built a little graphics uh, around it at, for the launch. And this is the uh, graphics on the left-hand side. Um, we did it with uh, ourselves and obviously Sun Mai and Taihu Brewing Company. Um, I would say in terms of craft beer, we're kind of the three leading kind of brewing craft beer brewing companies in, in uh, in Asia right now, or for in, in Taiwan. And uh, we, like I said, tasted it yesterday. So we'll go on the move about the tasting notes real quick. So uh, there, the picture on the left-hand side is the two, uh, two brewers from uh, Sun Mai and Taihu. Uh, they're probably, I would say, uh, Winnie and Marcy are probably two of the top uh, best brewers in all of Taiwan, uh, possibly all of Asia. Um, but what, what, I, what I tasted, then this is obviously predominantly just me, uh, but wasn't much bitterness came through, but it was super refreshing. Uh, there was a very clear aroma. I personally picked up a lot of stone fruit and grapefruit flavors um, in the aroma. Um, probably more predominant on the stone fruit uh, side, I would say, rather than the uh, grapefruit in terms of the, the aroma characteristic. Um, it was definitely reminiscent of Sabro. Uh, and then when you drank it, it came across as with, with orange candy flavors uh, and, and, and floral and potpourri flavors with just a, just a real tiny hint of uh, pininess or, you know, a piney resin. Uh, so uh, I would say it was, it was a fantastic beer. It turned out really well. I was, I was uh, over the moon with it. Um, and kind of, kind of looking back on it, I would say, you know, Definitely, it's, uh, it's great for sort of that West Coast style IPA, which, you know, we finish real dry and because the hop comes off almost as uh, a relatively sweet hop, which is pretty interesting given the relatively high alpha that comes off with. So, uh, you know, I definitely a hop for that kind of style and many other styles, but that was one that just kind of popped in my head. It's like, oh, that's, that would be a great usage model for, for, the, uh, for that hop. So... Um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I don't think I, yep, that's it. So let me go back to here. Did I lose everybody? No, <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> sure. There we go. So, um, and if there's any questions, I can, I can certainly, uh, I can certainly uh, follow up and, and, uh, and chat with anybody. But the bottom line though is, is that we're gonna launch this beer at a bar in Taiwan on Saturday afternoon. And I suspect it'll all be gone by Saturday evening <laughs> because it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really high quality product. And, uh, and the, the hop just, it really, it's really, I think the beer showcases the hop really nicely. Um, those stone fruit uh, aroma characteristics that are coming off it are absolutely amazing. The color is amazing uh, of the beer, and then the uh, the flavor that's coming off of it, uh, clearly coming primarily from the dry hop. Uh, we used the pato just to bitter it a little bit, um, but it didn't. The bitterness didn't come through. Uh, it really, I think, it was predominantly, uh, predominantly the six nine two the talus uh, came through on the dry hop side. So, really, really happy with it. Joe, how does that make you feel on the growers end hearing the success that Doug has had with your hop there? Oh, that's awesome, Doug. Uh, sounds like an awesome beer. Um, at some point, I'm going to come see you and drink some of that. Uh, probably not for a few months, unfortunately, but no, it's uh, that, that's the name of the game. You know, that's, that's why we're doing this. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very unique industry we find ourselves in. 
Um, the way beer is going, uh, you just can't make beer without hops. Uh, the way uh, the hop industry is currently formatted, there's nothing we can do with hops except sell it to brewers. Um, and so we are completely uh, united and relying, uh, co, uh, co relying on each other uh, for continued growth and success for, for uh, both of our respective groups of uh, customers and, and entities. But um, no, that's, that's exactly why we're, what we're doing, what we're doing. And it, it's, it makes us feel awesome. So we appreciate it. Well, I mean, we appreciate Yakima Chief too, especially Percy and everybody behind, behind you guys, uh, behind Percy on the team, because uh, without, uh, without that ability to get those uh, hops over to this uh, kind of, quite frankly, it's a little tiny island, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to make the beers that we do, and we wouldn't be able to provide that to the customers uh, here locally. So uh, we're very happy to have a partnership with, uh, with Yakima Chief. Uh, we're, you know, and we're you know, over the moon with this kind of hop, and, and it basically anything else that's, uh, that you put out in the past has been very, very, uh, very, very positive. Um, I think I venture to say we're probably one of the largest uh, purchasers on island of, uh, from Yakima Chief. So uh, um, uh, we, we buy a lot of hops and we use it. We, we're a pretty hop driven uh, uh, craft brewery. So uh, even some of our other kind of our red point standard beers are, are very hop driven. So, um, so, you know, we enjoy We enjoy the partnership and it's been, it's been lovely for the last six years. No, that's a good point, Doug. It's, uh, you know, we're on the two ends there, but there's a lot of magic uh, and a lot of hard work that happens in between. And um, you're fortunate to, to work with Jim and Percy. I mean, you know, Jim, it, he's been with us just for a few years, but has just really gone after it and done so many good things. And, and Percy is a living legend. Let's be honest. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. And the beer is going to be great on Saturday, I promise. <laughs> Everybody's going to love it. Joe, I'm going to ask you a question. With uh, I think because a lot of people attending this, um, it's their first time to hear about the complexity of the breeding program. Mm. And uh, an introduction, a lot of know what HBC is, um, but then had not known the behind the scenes. And, you know, you had mentioned agronomic and then, of course, from the brewing side, the two sides meet together. Mm. Do, you ever, do you ever come across the point where you have to have both or does one way out and you forward with it? Um, I'm just curious about that because I think it laid out very clear but is there ever where one you take one side because it's so good but maybe the other side isn't as good yeah no that, that's a that's a great question jim um and i guess a short answer would be um no um at this point like we talked about earlier with 200 and some named hop varieties out there um we're, we're not really in a hurry to push more brands on. Um, with the increasing difficulties with, with just farming in general and the uh, uncertainty year to year with that, um, that would be a really huge risk for us to ask our growers to take is like, hey, we think this hop's kind of cool. It, it might perform well for you on the farm. Um, that, that, that's where it starts first for us. To, to, to answer your question, I, Jim would be, First, it's got to make sense for our growing customers, right? So um, we are owned by family, three family farms, but we're working with 46 different farms now that, that grow at least one of our, one of our brands. And so, um, yeah, for, for us to um, grow that network of, of, of individuals and allow them to build the trust in our program and really get on board with this whole entire new normal, as we say, in the industry, um, it requires their buy-in first. And so uh, being a, a grower owned company, we obviously have to look out for the best interests of our, of our farmers first. Um, but that being said, you know, a 472 is actually a really good example of that through uh, that it's so novel and so unique. It's, it's sister of Sabro. Um, it's that one. It's very woody. It almost imparts um, a bourbon barrel flavor to beer. Um, it's, there's nothing else like it. But 
it only yields about six or seven bales per acre and the cones are all flared out and um, it just, it, the pickability of, of the variety is just, is, is, is not good. Um, that being said, it's so unique and so novel that we, we keep it around just, just as HBC 472, um, it will very unlikely ever be a brand. Um, but what it offers in beer is so unique that we keep it around, um, whether we want to go back and breed with it or just keep smaller quantities available for the, for the brewing customers that, that really love it. Um, and so good question. I think ultimately in a perfect world, it's going to be something that, you know, knocks it out of the park is disease resistant, uh, reduces the, the farm inputs as far as chemicals go, um, meets an acceptable, you know, 10, 10 to 11 bale per acre um, yield that, uh, and then or allows us to uh, get those returns to growers uh, up above is, is industry leading uh, return to growers. Um, that's really what it, what it comes down to is protecting that value all the way through the supply chain. So created in the breeding program, protected by what you all do at Yakima Chief, um, and, then, and then grown collectively with our growers and, and, and brewing customers. Thank you. Interesting you mentioned uh, 472. There's, there, there's a number of our Korean friends that have joined and this past year, um, a year ago this past May, um, 472 dry hop beer won the first uh, Alpha King that we did. Uh, in fact, one of our distributors from Brew Source, Jason Lee, yeah. uh, the amazing brewery, um, won with a, a 472. And we've always, they've always wondered, we get asked a lot of questions about 472 because Korea, Japan, there's been tremendous acceptance with this, uh, with this hop in those two markets. And we were always curious drive the commercialization of it or is it something that's going to always be kept around and it's created its own brand because it's known as HBC 472. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's, it's going to be some semblance of that. You know, it's, it's not going anywhere for those brewing customers that have, have, have fallen for that and, and love using it. Um, it's not going anywhere. You know, I, I think there's, there's so much more to be learned uh, about that hop. Uh, especially just how it performs in the brew house, because it is uh, that, that Neo-Mexican, Neo-Mexicanist lineage with Sabro. Um, it, it, it has a flavor profile that, that is a little bit polarizing. Um, it is what it is. Some people uh, smell it and taste it and say, this is so weird and cool. And some people say, this is so weird. Take this away, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's, it's polarizing. And, and like Doug said, with, with Talus, it shares some of that Sabro-esque um, on, on the more uh, kind of the woodiness, the coconutty side a little bit, but way, to way toned down, uh, in my opinion, below Sabro. But you still definitely see, oh, yeah, I could, I could see how that's a descendant of Sabro. Um, it, it definitely has some similarities, but I think stands, stands alone in a more fruit-forward uh, way than Sabro does and, and doesn't have a lot of those uh, – those notes that can be a little bit off-putting for some folks. Something that you mentioned there with the neo Mexicanus line, maybe comment on that because I think we have a lot of people online that may not know what that actually means. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's an interesting, because I, I don't know if you remember when I first hired on, that's what Jay talked to me about. And, and it was the very first thing I learned when I came into the company. So it's a yeah. interest, and I want people to hear the, you know, a little bit more about that, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a fascinating history. I mean, it's, you know, we're not the first people in world history to, to breed hops. Um, people have been, there's hops referenced in literature a thousand years ago. Um, and people have been uh, propagating land race varieties and breeding, breeding hops uh, for, for ages. Um, when North America was founded by mostly Europeans, um, at that point, no one had any knowledge of hops in the new world. Um, and so if they were going to take that plunge and, and sail across the ocean, they, you better, you better believe they were going to make sure they had beer when they got there. So a lot of those Europeans brought the land race varieties from wherever they came from, whether it be Czech or UK varieties or German varieties. And a lot of the early, uh, American 
varieties were, were descendants of a lot of those UK varieties um, mostly. And so um, I think it's fascinating to look at that, you know, even up until, uh, you know, the, the middle, even the latter half of, uh, of the 20th century, we didn't think that we had any uh, native hop species in North America. Um, there had been lupuloides, uh, I guess to go back a little bit there, Cumulus lupulus lupulus is the main uh, genetic framework that we use for a lot of the varieties we use. There's also Japonicus, there's lupuloides, um, there's different, uh, different varieties of hops that, that, are, that are indigenous to certain regions of the world. Um, up until very recently, we didn't think that we had any here in North America. However, Neo-Mexicanus, as the name implies, um, so down in the Rocky Mountains of the American Southwest, uh, near the Grand Canyon, northern Arizona, northern New Mexico. Everybody thinks about that area being just a big 115 degree desert, but really northern Arizona and northern Mex New Mexico are very much in the Rocky Mountains in very high elevations. Um, so Humulus lupulus neomexicanus was actually found as a indigenous hop species in the American Southwest. Um, we, Chuck Zimmerman actually, Jason's uh, mentor, was able to secure a wild uh, Neo-Mexicanus female um, in the early 90s. And they were able to, it was basically, uh, you know, talking about agronomics, Jim, it was, it was ugly. The cones stank, uh, the, the growth pattern was nothing you'd ever want to um, use for a commercial variety. Um, certain years it would bloom so, you know, bloom so late that it was not viable to make crosses on or would not even bloom at all. Um, and so as the story goes, they were uh, basically done with all their crosses for that, for that year and were going through uh, the, the laboratory and getting rid of old inventory um, of pollen and all sorts of different stuff. So they basically were cleaning out the fridge of all these different uh, uh, male pollens that were no, no longer usable for that year because they, they'll lose their viability if not stored properly. So they were basically getting rid of all this pollen and they were on the way out to go throw it all away and saw that this Neo-Mexicanus plant was actually blooming and receptive. So they're like, no way. And so they just took this whole bucket of all these mixed uh, pollens and went and doused this female Neo-Mexicanus plant in all these different pollens, um, which it, the term for it in, is open pollination. So when we, when we don't know what the exact parentage is, uh, it's, it's deemed an open pollination. So we know what the maternal parent is. We don't know uh, who the paternal parent is. Um, so just one of those crazy uh, strokes of luck, both Sabro and 472 uh, came out of that cross. Uh, now ultimately Talus, right? Talus wouldn't be here without that cross either. Um, exactly. So pretty amazing how that works um, and, and, and really how we've, we've been able to incorporate uh, Neo-Mexicanus genetics into the rest of our breeding program. So it's, uh, you know, the last couple of releases have been, have had Neo-Mexicanus heritage, but really it's, it's just an incorporation of those genetics into our overall germplasm that is starting to create some of these newer crosses coming out. Fascinating, fascinating. Oh, well, that's the point I wanted to make is that, is, is what you just said, that Talos we wouldn't be celebrating 692 or Talos without that fortuitous moment that happened in the early 90s. That was the right. first, my first day at the company is what I learned. But uh, I actually think, uh, Madison, Nicole, do we have a, do we have a, a movie that we wanted or a, a quick video that we wanted to show? The excitement around HPC 692 has really led us to make the next decision to, to bring that in and, and make it a named brand. HPC 692 will be known as Talus moving forward. So for us, Talus represents those rocky slopes at the bottom of a lot of the mountains we have here in the Northwest. So the exciting thing about Talus is just how it performs in the brew house. Uh, when you're evaluating that raw hop in the field, that's exactly the profile that you're getting in that finished beer. And so there's not a lot of guesswork. Brewers know what to expect and they know what that, that beer is gonna taste like at the end. So Talus's aroma profile is pretty intense, consisting of pink grapefruit, citrus rinds, and dried roses, along with pine resin, tropical fruit, and sage. 
with that Neo Mexicanus flavor profile that Sabro and, and a lot of her sisters offers, we wanted to go back and, and breed back on that. And 692 was one of the many daughters that came out of that cross. All of the breweries that, that are using it are really excited and looking forward to contracting for it. We think it has a very bright future in our portfolio. Joe's taking that. I'm going to throw a question to you if that's okay. We have one question in our um, in our uh, in our queue, and Doug, going to put you on the spot because I think you could be more versed to answer this. Um, if you had to take a guess, what hops do you think most people will use with Talus in a beer? I think you're on mute, Doug. That's there. better. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think you could use, uh, I mean, because it comes off with such a strong kind of floral and potpourri, I mean, it's a great dry hop, uh, there's no doubt. Um, and then it provides that nose, which is a grapefruit and stone fruit. I mean, I think you'd want to pair that up with a with a decent alpha uh, bittering like a, like a pato or a um, you know, I think you could probably put Simcoe in the bittering hop. You could probably do something like uh, uh, maybe even a Sriracha Ace, which is if you want to get a little weird. Um, uh, and then uh, and then just kind of finish it off uh, sort of late stage edition with something maybe a bit more um, a bit more resiny, like, like an Equinot or something on, along those lines. I think those would be, you know, very solid hop choices to pair it up with. Um, I would leave, I would leave it, I would leave it as a dry hop and and only single dry hop, but no nothing else in the dry hop because that that hop stands on its own basically. I don't think there's any reason to uh, to jazz it up with any kind of combination. Fantastic. Um, Percy, do you did you you had mentioned earlier? Do you want to give a um, um, a little update on on what what we have going on in Hong Kong? Yes, yes, you know. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you, you know, Joe, you know, and Doug, you know, for your excellent, you know, presentation. I think, you know, we all agree, you know, yeah, Talos, you know, definitely, you know, it's a great hops. Yeah. And I think, you know, many people, you know, will love it. Uh, so this, first of all, this product, you know, is now available, you know, in Asia. So if anyone, you know, of you want to get it, just call, you know, ID Jim, you know, and me. Okay. In the meantime, yeah, uh, we will, you know, have a very special project, you know, in next week. What we're going to do is you know, we are going to work you know, with uh, top three you know, craft brewery in Hong Kong, making a collaboration beer using some fresh you know, Thanos hop. Exciting, right? Yeah. But this is really challenging yeah, because you know, we need to deliver the fresh hop you know, yeah, from the farm to Hong Kong within you know, two to three days. So it's really challenging. You know. Think of course you know, we can make it. Okay. Yeah. So of course, after we make it, I'll try to research some, you know, in our office, and if you guys, you know, can come to Hong Kong, you know, yeah, I'll give you a try, have a try. Yeah, that's it, okay. Mm -hmm. We'll just open this up to questions. I'm looking in the Q&A field um, for the participants, and I, I don't have access to the, the WOVA app, um, Madison or, or Nicole, if you could share any of those questions. For those of you still with us, I know that uh, Joe needs to get out of there. Doug's got to get over to the brew house. Um, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. It uh, doesn't look like we have any from Wova app, but it looks like we may. Can we get some uh, Gorilla, Paul? I know this is you. Uh, can we get some fresh towels hops sent to Korea? Um, I'm going to answer that for, for uh, Madison and, and Percy, if that's OK. Um, I'm assuming this is you, Paul, and I'm pretty sure it's you. Not this year. We we did Korea last year, and and the reality is is, is that COVID really knocked out. Madison is, is much more fluent on the, the that part of the logistics, but it just was going to make it very difficult. Um, and the uh, with flights, um, the logistics in Hong Kong opened up quite nicely in terms of a possibility. 
but this is certainly something we want to entertain next year. Uh, we were very grateful to Korea for being able to get it in. Or uh, We did Autonom. We did, uh, Madison, what else did we do uh, besides Autonom last year? I can't remember. Um, I believe we sent some Equinot over. Yeah. But yeah, we're just taking one groundbreaking task at a time this year. <laughs> Exactly. So we're excited to see how it goes with um, Hong Kong as we try to venture to another region in Asia outside of the U.S. with this project. Absolutely. Um, um, and it's, as Percy mentioned, it's an incredible amount of logistics to, to get this. Joe actually meets us at the, at the farm. We load, we inspect, and it's basically straight off to the airport. But hopefully Korea next year, Hong Kong this year. But um, I don't see any other questions on here. And Joe, we can, um, and I'll just throw this out there. We'll make sure that the email addresses are available. Um, so you can, um, any of your questions after the, the commentary, you can uh, certainly email us. Let's see, maybe not, uh, let me read this one. Um, um, maybe not a question, but a comment. I found it interesting that Doug described Talos as a good option for a West Coast IPA. As a Pacific Northwesterner, that's very normal for me, but for someone halfway around the globe, are there any other styles in that part of the world that lean into a use for the hop? Or is it the West Coast IPA really a global style? Doug, serving yet up to you, my friend. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I, I say styles are universal. They are, they, they go across time zones and countries. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of people out here brewing West Coast style IPAs, um, you know, juicy pale ales and, and stouts and some lagers and things of that nature all over the place. So we, I mean, uh, I don't feel like, uh, um, I don't feel like Asia is, is, is creating new, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, BJ, uh, CP standards. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not doing anything uh, sort of at, th at that level. We're, we're definitely kind of following those type of types and styles of beers out here. Um, sometimes we get, um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get uh, beers that have a, a local flair to it. So, but I would still say they kind of fall into the same kind of same styles. So we might have a, you know, sort of a kind of a spiced beer that uses, uh, you know, some local you know, pepper in Taiwan, but, you know, at the end of the day, it still kind of falls in that category. And so, uh, you know, when I say West Coast IPA, you know, in Taiwan, I would brew West Coast IPA in Taiwan and sell it as a West Coast IPA in Taiwan. And people here uh, generally, and Asia, I think in general, uh, people that know craft beer and, or, or enjoy, in, enjoy having a couple, you know, craft beers uh, in their in their spare time will understand that style and will, you know, and there won't be any, it'll be, it'll be, an, it's an easy sell. They, they will be able to understand that and, and, and take it and drink it and appreciate it for what it is. Excellent reply. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, nice comments there. Um, just a quick look at the Q and A. It looks like we're, we're, we're out. I know Joe probably needs to get on home. Doug's got to get over to the brew house. Madison, would you like to close us out or? Yeah, I'd like to again thank our speakers today, Joe and Doug. We really appreciate your time. I know poor Joe has been on a rather long day as we are full swing in harvest. And with that being said, this is just one of many sessions that we're doing in the virtual harvest this year in order to keep everybody informed about what is going on in the Yakima Valley and brewers around the world. Like we mentioned and heard from Doug today, some of the uniqueness or non-uniquenesses of the brewing industry around the world. You know, the commonality between the beer types is fascinating and learning from each other on how we can use hops such as Talus to create the next wave in the brewing industry. So again, thank you for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah, thank you.